Before I became a cab driver, I had no idea what this job was like, what it even entailed on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the video that's gonna give us the truth of what it's like day-to-day -day driving a taxi driver. And no, it's not lounging around, sitting outside of cafes, because at some point, I've gotta to go to work. So, let's go. Let's talk about passengers, or really, lack of talking with passengers. It's one of those things that I thought to be a cab driver, I had to be this social kind of geezer, you know, all right, love, how's it going? If anything, I'd say probably about 80% of the jobs I do in the taxi are conducted in total silence. You know, I'll say, hey, how's it going to the passengers? And then from that point, it's up to them whether they want to engage your conversation or not because this is their taxi journey. For some people, it might be the most quiet, relaxing part of the day and they don't want to be interrupted or they might want to get onto some sort of business or just pull their phone out uh, and be away. And that was a big stress relief off of my shoulders because I thought that was something I had to come as part of the job. I remember doing a really long job actually from Loughborough Road up to Tuffmore Park and like halfway through, the passengers hadn't said anything and the sort of silence was crippling me a bit. And I just sort of had to say, hey, how's it going in the back? Are you all right? And they were like, yeah, we're fine, thanks, mate. And I then sort of learned, oh, okay, don't really do that. That's a stupid thing. You know, for the most part, I just enjoy like the silence, just the zen of driving. If anything, people being silent is better because sometimes they open their mouth and they then soon instantly give away the game that they are a weird passenger. 95% of people are completely normal and you might get the odd person who just raises a few suspicions in the back of your mind. And sometimes it's the weirdest ones that end up being the ones that give you the biggest tip at the end. There's just all kind of eccentric people in life. Generally, it's about consistency. Like, you can spot the weird ones a mile off because they don't fit the norm of the type of jobs you do or where you are and where they're there going to. It sort of stands out quite a bit. And I think people do this in any line of work. There's a certain kind of remit of who your target audience are or who your passenger is. And when someone breaks that norm or cultural convention, then it really stands out. So thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. Let's talk about what driving is like on the day-to-day. One of the things I assumed quite wrongly about doing the knowledge was the fact that I can work when I want. I could be out here at all hours. When really, if you speak to most taxi drivers, they will fall into some kind of a rhythm or routine, which is super strange because there is nothing actually forcing me to come out at a given time of day. Just the fact that I enjoy a certain time of day and by having some kind of rhythm, some kind of homeostasis that I set my life to, it just makes it a lot easier. I generally know what to expect in terms of traffic, where to head, where the work's gonna be, that kind of thing. I get to work around two o'clock, the ranks might have a few cabs on them, and then it picks up a little bit more by around about four o'clock time as people start gearing up for going home. Then you have people going into restaurants and things like that for about six o'clock, seven o'clock, maybe even to eight o'clock. And then you have a bit of a slack period between eight and nine o'clock. And that's good because that allows me a bit of time to go get some dinner before starting again about 10 o'clock when everyone comes piling out of the restaurants uh, and theatres. But what about the actual driving? What does the job actually feel like? Well, in terms of actually people hailing me down on the street, the most remarkable comparison I can point to is fishing. If you've ever been fishing, you just sit there on the lake, you put your float, you put your bait out in an area that you think might be correct, and you just sit and look at that float and you just wait for that float to move a little bit. Sometimes it might go under for a brief second or so. It's a bit like one of your colleagues getting a job and you think, oh, it's gonna be my turn soon. But there's no better feeling when you see a passenger put their arm up in the air, nice, loud and proud. It's amazing that they can come up to the cab, could tell you anywhere in London and quite confidently, I know where to go, I know how it's gonna work. Another way of thinking about my job is it's very much like a video game. It's a bit like Crazy Taxi, obviously as the name suggests, but you just wanna to get to an area where you can pick someone up, get them in, drop them off as soon as possible, get onto the next job. You get the bonuses for turning over more of those, exactly like that video game. Or how about Grand Theft Auto? 
when you learn the map inside out of Grand Theft Auto and you can habitually just go, right, I need to drive over to that island. I know how to get there. I know how to get the bridge or whatever. You know, I don't really think about streets so much anymore. It's just a case of keeping the flow and just moving in kind of whatever way works. Sometimes my job is a bit like a platformer. I'm looking at waiting for these lights to turn green, but I'm also looking at is any of these people going to jump out in front of the lights as they turn green? So it's not just a case of just putting your foot down because it turns green. You have to calculate and actually adjust your speed to pretty much look for hazards before they happen, as you would do on a platform video game. Look, I'm turning left now. <laughs> These people are walking out. So I have to appropriately adjust my speed to that. And it's one of the ways I find of breaking up the monotony of the job because it does get boring. But you look at it in the, in the eyes of a video game, it just makes it a bit more processable. It's less stressful that people are walking out in front of you and it gamifies the whole experience. Is my job stressful? Does the traffic stress me out? And no, not really, because all stress is, is bad expectations. My perfect analogy, I would say. So if your commute takes 30 minutes day in, day out, but then one day your commute is one hour because of a hold up or whatever, well, you'd be pretty stressed because you have an expectation that your commute is 30 minutes. And that's no different across London. There's always gonna be traffic in some areas. And over time, I've built up this kind of calibration of how much traffic should be in a given area at a given time. It's when the reality is different from that expectation where stress occurs. And even then, I know not to be stressful about it because end of the day it's London, it's variable. Stuff like this is gonna happen. So I kind of go in with the glass half empty approach, thinking that traffic could be quite bad there and prepare myself for that. And if it's better, then that's you know less stress on me, obviously. So basically I just set very low expectations. It's quite a stoical thing to do and guide to survival in the taxi, I guess. Tube strikes can be quite annoying because of course more people are out in cars, that then builds up and you can't really have an honest expectation of what the traffic's gonna be like when everyone decides to come out in their cars. Managing passengers' expectations of traffic, now that can be a little bit stressful because you're having to sort of control the situation a little bit. You know, like when someone gets in and they just look at the first line of cars and they say, cool, isn't the traffic bad? And you're like, no, this is normal. The analogy I'd liken it to is looking over an engineer's shoulder whilst they're doing a bit of you know, metal work. There might be swarf and all bits of crap flying everywhere, but you're not looking at him going, ooh, you're making a bit of mess there, mate. Right hand down. It will all be sorted at the end. And the same in London. I'm not intentionally wanting to sit in traffic because I'm rewarded for turning over jobs. Just ride with it, I'm doing my best. I wanna get you there so I can get onto the next job. Might be a little bit messy, but at the end, you'll get to your destination. And of course, once I drop the passenger off, there's the matter of getting paid. Now, thankfully, in almost six years of working as a cabbie, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that I've not been paid, that a passenger has got away without paying. So it's not that bad odds, but generally when I'm out driving and I'm hitting the meter and people are paying me, it sounds really bizarre, but I'm not thinking about the money. Like I come out and I work my hours and it's a weird notion to think of because as a passenger, you might be glued to the meter or you might think, right, I've got to pay 20 quid for this journey, whatever. But for me, I don't associate with that. Couple of reasons. First off, if they do a runner, I've lost it. So there's no point you know, counting your chickens before they've even hatched. Secondly, that money isn't actually mine until later on because it's still got to appear in my bank. I've still got to pay for things like the taxi, petrol, all other kinds of expenses, and just general living expenses as well. It's a bit pointless thinking about it in the moment. I know of some drivers who like to have a bit of a daily target of what they earn, but generally when I come out, I just think about the hours that I need to work. Hours is kind of the limitation that I will have and that I can actually control. If I'm thinking about some hypothetical number of what I want to earn in a day-to-day -day shift, again, coming back to expectations, it's only going to be bad when I don't meet that number. Or what about if I exceed that number early? Do I go home at that point or do I carry on staying out for longer? Look at it this way. If I earn £350 in a given day shift, well, that sounds quite impressive, doesn't it? You pat yourself on the back. But if I don't go to work the rest of the week, well, I'm at a serious loss because of the expenses of the taxi. You know, even each job, like you might get a good job, but I'm never like, oh, I just earned 25 quid there. I earned 30 quid there. Cause it's like, 
it's just a job. Like you have to do multiples of those for it to add up. I think it goes back to the idea of being salaried or being employed. Most employers will give you an annual salary because it separates the fact that you actually have an hourly worth. And I don't like to think of my time as being an hourly worth because it's not a nice way to quantify your existence. Don't really think about the money too much. Just hit it, collect it, and I'll count up later on, and we'll just see. If I'm running short of money one month, then I'll go out in the cab. So whilst we're talking about money, let's address the assumption that people have about Friday nights. People just assume that Friday night is a busy night and that that is like a time that cabbies have to work. But no, I generally just go to work to go to work. Not because it's gonna be, quote, busier. I really can't quantify what is busier. You know, there might be more people about on a Friday night or on the weekend, but the multiplier might only be like times 1.2x. It's not like I go out on a Friday night and I earn 10 times the amount of money as what I would do on a Monday. And again, it comes back to the idea that you still need multiple days of the week to make up like your whole weekly earnings to make the, the cab worthwhile. So people are like, oh, it's gonna be a busy Friday night for you. And it's like, yeah, but also with that comes traffic. Sometimes Mondays are better for me because I can actually drive around. I can get passengers to their destination. Might be more likely to get a tip. Might be the more regular kind of Londoners. So there's always these things to consider, but it's never like, oh, I'm gonna go to work when it's raining because there's gonna be more people needing taxis. Or I'm gonna go to work during a tube strike because if anything, it's actually more difficult to work those days. They can be profitable, but if you can't get around, then your likelihood of earning money or the reliability of earning money is seriously diminished. A pound note is a pound note. Whether it gets earned in the rain, in the nighttime, or in the daytime, it's still money and you just need a good amount of time to be able to do that. Speaking of time, I won't go to work after three o'clock. I've known of a few cab drivers that have this similar kind of ethos. If they get wrapped up in activities at home, and let's say they normally start at two o'clock, and the day goes on a bit, you slowly compress your potential window for earnings. So I know that I want to be home around midnight so I can get home, get decent sleep, rather than trying to burn the candle at both ends. You know, let's say it's four o'clock and I think, right, I'm gonna to get to work. It's not gonna be five o'clock until I'm actually in town. It's probably not gonna be till half five until I've completed my first job. So potentially, I've only got about four and a half hours of earning potential. It's obvious really, because if it costs you 20 pounds of fuel in the taxi and you go out and you earn 100 pounds, well, you're down to 80 pounds straight away. Then you've got to take out other expenses like the taxi itself. Uh, you've also got to take your taxis out of that as well. You've not got a lot of money to show for it, but your actual time investment might be eight hours from home to home. It's kind of annoying, it's frustrating to know I've missed out on a whole day of work but it's the realities of the job. When I do come to work, I will generally start in a certain area, but cabbies generally don't work specific areas. I always used to think like, if you see a cab rolling down Earl's Court Road with its light on, you think, oh, that driver's come to work in Earl's Court Road. But no, the general working pattern of most cabbies is that you get into town, you get a job which pulls you in a completely random direction, and then you just wanna get yourself to another area where you can get yourself another job. So it's kind of like being led astray and you're just always fighting to get yourself back to an area. So the cabbie might have just dropped off in Kensington High Street, Earls Court Road, somewhere like that. And they're just looking for the next available job. They haven't specifically traveled to that area to work in that area because we can work all over London. You do get some drivers that say, look, I don't work the city of London because there's a lot of traffic restrictions there. They're worried about getting stuck in a certain restriction and having a pretty terrible service for the passenger. So they might turn their light off and go to somewhere a bit more accessible. And maybe there's drivers who like working around Knightsbridge because of the clientele, etc. But for the most part, the majority of taxi drivers, it's a case of just working all areas of London to be as efficient as possible. Cabs also aren't always busy. If you are on the street and you see taxis going past and you think, oh, that cab's got a passenger on, that cab's got a passenger on, you have zero concept of where those jobs might have originated from. Just because they're all going down Oxford Street and they've got passengers on, isn't an indication that Oxford Street itself is busy. They might have come from a station and at that station, they might have waited 20 minutes for that job. To get to the station, they might have had to drive 10 minutes to then wait 20 minutes. So it might have been 30 minutes before they've actually got that job on. So you can't just look at a live street and think, oh, it's really busy out. 
Maybe if you're struggling to hail a taxi, then yeah, it could be busy. But there's no easy way to gauge where that driver's come from. Sometimes I do it, I look at what the meter is at at the taxi in front of me. If it's 15 quid at Oxford Street, more than likely, it's probably come from the city, might have come from King's Cross, something like that. And on the subject of taxi ranks, here's something I never really would have ever imagined. Taxi ranks generally move. You'd be forgiven the thinking that it's just an endless line of taxis. And you'd think, why would a driver bother sitting in this gigantic queue that seemingly never moves? But if you pay enough attention, and depending on the time of year, you will see that the rank generally does move. Add into the fact that it's not always about the very frontmost portion of the taxi rank, but you have various points. If there's breaks in the rank, where drivers can get jobs. So whenever I join a taxi rank, the mental calculation that goes on in my mind is, will waiting on this rank be less time than driving and trying to find a job on the streets? Now, obviously that is impossible to quantify. It's just an interpretation, but I can still have a rough gauge of it depending on where I am. And you'll have seen it in some of my shift videos. If the rank looks like it's moving, I'll generally join it because all I'm really interested in is not whether it's a taxi rank or where I'm picking the job up from. No, it's just get me a job as soon as possible. What can be really bizarre in the taxi is just how predictable some jobs can be. Here's an example. Five o'clock in the city of London, coming down Fetter Lane and I turn right onto Fleet Street. Outside the Royal Courts of Justice, someone puts a hand up. I can probably take the words out of their mouth and say, Waterloo steps. There's certain kinds of jobs that warrant certain kinds of areas. You'll have seen it in my shift videos when I'm at Selfridges and people are say Harrods or Knightsbridge. When you pick up an American from Westminster Abbey and they say Tower of London please driver. Or when you're going up Farringdon Road and you see an office worker who's strategically positioned themselves on the west side of the road, meaning that when they hail you down, they know that you're in the correct direction to take them up to Islington. In some ways it's very predictable and it's the outliers that really throw you up. A bit like the passengers, like certain types of passengers getting in at different times. Same goes with destinations. Dropping someone off at a shop in the middle of the night might raise alarm bells. You know, are they a service contractor who's going in to do a bit of maintenance? Dropping someone off at a restaurant after it's closed? Those kinds of things. What throws it slightly as well was that when I was on the knowledge, you would do really long jobs across the map. You know, you might be going from Islington down to Putney. And they're the sort of jobs that you'd rarely sort of do in the cab. It's more kind of area focused. Chelsea and Fulham kind of links in quite neatly with like Battersea uh, and Wandsworth. So people kind of in that area of the map, you will see that certain people will go to like a nearby area for their kind of high street. We're just off of St. John's Wood High Street right now, but you might get people from Primrose Hill make their way here. You might have people over on the other side of St. John's Wood come here rather than going over to West Hampstead. Marylebone High Street, I often drop people in say Bayswater or even up here like in Primrose Hill and St. John's Wood because it will have more of a high street than the area that they've come in from. Those areas kind of link with one another. They're like the typical jobs that those areas give out. And then every now and again, you might get an anomaly, which isn't one of those. A lot of jobs you get in the cab are quite predictable. I don't really stop when I'm in the taxi. When you're on the knowledge, you have this notion that you go into all these different places and you think, I can just drop into that restaurant. I'm going to drop into that bar and I'm going to see all of London. But really, you just get off the job and get straight back onto the next one. You might stop uh, maybe for dinner and some of the older cab drivers are much better at sort of stopping, relaxing, chilling out. But I feel like I've come to town to work. Quite simple really. If on a day that I'm out in the taxi, it's very rare that I break 3000 steps because I just wake up, go to work and then come home. And you might say, why not just get out of the cab and do a little walk once you drop someone off? but it's not always that easy. If I drop someone off on Oxford Street, well, I'm not gonna be doing that little walk and pulling up the cab on Oxford Street, obviously. So then I've got to get off of Oxford Street, find a suitable and safe place to do that, look out for a traffic warden, and also factor in the time of actually getting off of Oxford Street, when I might as well have just carried on driving and pick someone up. And maybe, and the most likely scenario when I do do this practice, is when I get longer jobs out of the center. So if I end up, down in Dulwich, or if I'm up in Hampstead, then I will maybe just stop, turn off the cab, go for a little walk. It's a case of just grabbing your lunch, guzzling your wife food, whatever, and away you go again. 
You know, this hypothesis came to me the other day when I was in the city of London. I wanted some lunch. I was in the city of London at one o'clock. Every establishment had a queue outside of the building and possibly around the corner. It was ridiculous. I think a lot of these office workers probably got satisfaction in joining the biggest queue because they're still kind of getting paid. If they're late back to the office, they just say, ah, sorry, boss, the queue was really long. So I realized in that moment, an office worker is gonna be able to out queue me any day of the week because I just wanna get in, grab lunch, maybe enjoy it a little bit, but I'm just straight back to work again. That's the reality of it. That's some of the honest truths about being a taxi driver. If you wanna see some of the honest truths about the expenses or even the earnings of a taxi driver, then I'll leave those two videos over there. Yep. <laughs> See you again soon.